Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. As it plays a key role in the war in Ukraine and rallies against Russian expansionism, how does Poland see the future of this conflict and its role in the world? Let's get to the bottom line. Since day one, Poland has stood firmly beside Ukraine as it tries to defend itself against Russia's invasion, the atrocities of war there, and an unknown future. About half of the Ukrainian refugees fleeing this war, around three million people, have been absorbed by Poland, and it's been the major passageway for NATO-provided weapons flowing into Ukraine for the last three months. But it hasn't been easy. Russian political and military leaders are now threatening Warsaw for providing material support for Ukraine. And according to some recent estimates, Poland gets more than half of its energy from Russia. It's trying to end its dependency on Russia, but Poland is a large nation and its supplies will need to be backstopped by its Western allies. But will the math of all this add up? Joining me today is Poland's ambassador to the United States, Marek Magyarowski. Before arriving in Washington last fall, he was Poland's ambassador to Israel. And for more than 20 years before that, he was a journalist and columnist in his country. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. So you know thank this game, Thank you very game, much right? for having me. Uh, it's great. I mean, you, you understand the journalist questions and, and the give and take, and I really appreciate you being here today. But what I'd like to give our audience an understanding of is how does the Polish citizen see across its border into what's happening in Ukraine, and what are they feeling, what are they seeing, and how is it absolutely relevant to their lives? What Polish citizens see now in Ukraine is a barbaric war unleashed by an um, autocratic regime against an independent and free country. Uh, I've always uh, been pretty adamant, and I've said this repeatedly during my stay here in Washington, that we are facing an imminent threat uh, we have been talking about Russia's neo-imperial ambitions all along, and nobody listened, at least in Europe. There were many countries which considered Poles, my fellow countrymen, as paranoid and russophobic. Now it turns out that we were right for so many years, for decades, about uh, Russia's real intent on our continent and uh, in a wider picture. I think it's really important that you said it because I remember when Poland would... Uh, outline its concerns. It would ask for uh, more U.S. military and NATO military forces to be si uh, deployed in Poland. But there was this view that Russia was kind of a basket case and that would never create the kind of tensions and threat that it has now. When did that shift? You know, I'm lucky to have lived under both systems because I was born under communism and I experienced command economy. And then I lived under democracy and under savage capitalism in Poland, which I enjoyed so much, especially at the beginning of the 90s. Mm. And now I know something about the Soviet mentality. And you can now see vestiges, if you will, of that Soviet mentality in contemporary Russia, especially among the political elites which now rule this country uh, from the Kremlin. Um, I believe it's very... I'm not a soothsayer, so it's very... It's extremely difficult for me to predict what will happen in Russia uh, over the next uh, two weeks, two months or two years, let alone Europe. Uh, to what extent Russia will try to destabilize the situation uh, in the whole region. Um, I think Putin, and it's no secret that Putin has an obsession with Ukraine. We can only uh, uh, re remind our viewers uh, of that famous essay he wrote and published in July last year in which he claimed that Russians and Ukrainians are the same nation. They shared the same history. Uh, paradoxically, what Putin has proven so far since the beginning of his war and Russia's war against Ukraine is the mere fact that Russians and Ukrainians are not the same nation. So he has strengthened the Ukrainian national identity. And, uh, of course, if we, going back to your initial question about Poland's role and Poland's vision, uh, I believe that uh, Putin's main fear is to have a prosperous, wealthy country at Russia's border, a post-Soviet republic, we were lucky not to be a Soviet Republic after World War II. Ukraine uh, was a Soviet Republic for decades. Uh, and this is the, the, the main preoccupation and the main apprehension of the, of the Russian ruling class nowadays. No, I, I don't want to ask you to speak for the Russian people, but I'm going to anyway. And there's another dimension here where we see polls that show a lot of support for Putin. Now, I happen to know a lot of Russian people, and, I, and, and at least the ones I've talked to, um, don't feel such support. They don't 
Uh, they can't talk publicly about it without fear of, you know, incredible reprisal and, and threats from the Russian government. But, you know, when you sort of look at what's unfolding, what's happening, and, and, and Russia is being isolated right now, you're the closest it's person becoming I know a to Russians, you know Russian yeah. folks. Are they not getting a sense of the crisis that, that essentially they're going to be cut off from so much of what we consider modernity now. Uh, Putin came to power in, in the year 2000. So it's been uh, more than 22 years of brainwashing and indoctrination. Hmm. As I said, Putin lives with uh, his obsession. He actually lives in the past, not in the present. Hmm. He still feels humiliated. It was him who defined the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism as the greatest um, uh, calamity uh, in, in terms of uh, geopolitics in the 20th century. Uh, those were his, pre his precise words, uh, defining that, that uh, watershed moment in Europe's uh, history. He is feeding himself with that uh, obsession. So he also considers the Russians not only himself, but also the Russian society as humiliated, constantly humiliated by NATO, by the West, by the free world. He's not using this term, but we should start using this term the free world, mm. uh, juxtaposed to what uh, the Russian society is experiencing now. So, um, on the one hand, I'm not surprised by all those polls which have been coming out over the last weeks, uh, only some of them uh, relatively credible, about uh, the Russian societies uh, and the Russian population's support for the war and for Putin himself, between 70 and 80 percent of, of the people um, uh, support this uh, military operation in Ukraine. Uh, uh, again, I think that maybe those numbers are not precise, but it's uh, imaginable that this is uh, uh, more or less the support Putin is enjoying right now in the Russian society, only because, maybe not only, maybe not, this is not the only factor and the, the only reason, but, uh, but principally uh, because of that sense of humiliation and because of that a sense of encirclement by NATO, which is a completely false claim, but uh, I would say deeply embedded in the Russian collective psyche. You know, another thing we've all been watching is sort of the heroism of the Polish people on another front, and that is providing homes for Ukrainian refugees. Um, I mean, millions and millions of people, and to my knowledge, you don't have refugee camps. You don't have... It's a very different kind of absorption of Ukrainian people, and it begs the question of what's going on, how does Poland carry that load? Because even if millions of refugees are going to homes, that's a huge uh, demand on infrastructure, and of course it w may eventually change, you know, the pool of talent that you have working on said Poland. This is a long-term thing. Can, can you give our uh, watchers an understanding of I'm that not surprised. dynamic? I'm not surprised by that outpouring of solidarity and sympathy towards our Ukrainian uh, brethren, uh, maybe slightly. But we've always been generous. Hmm. I think that the image of, of uh, Poland as a country which is uh, somehow inherently anti-immigrant uh, is completely false, uh, totally distorted. So I'm, I'm not, I was not surprised by that uh, uh, outburst of, of solidarity on the part of the Polish uh, society. You are absolutely right that there are no refugee camps in Poland. This is probably the first uh, humanitarian crisis and the refugee crisis in Europe's history in which the host country does not need to build refugee camps. We've had some, uh, a few congressional delegations coming to Poland from America, and uh, uh, many of those congressmen were asking their Polish counterparts, where are the refugee camps? We would like to visit one. Unfortunately, they couldn't. Uh, but they did meet with um, uh, Ukrainian refugees, who are, uh, of course, extremely grateful to mm. Poles and to the Polish society for that uh, uh, reception. Um, on the other hand, also, of course, it's a huge burden also. Uh, 3.4 million refugees who have already crossed the border into Poland since the beginning of the hostilities. Uh, some of them re-emigrated to other European countries. Some of them e returned to Ukraine. Uh, by the way, um, uh, thanks to uh, a bill which was approved by the Polish parliament a few weeks ago, all those Ukrainian refugees can apply for Polish ID. More than a million mm. uh, did so far. And... Uh, about 94% of those people are women and children, 94%. All men fighting in Ukraine for their homelands, freedom and, and sovereignty. Um, this is incredible. This is something which will be uh, unforgettable 
and uh, remembered for many years to come by both nations. And, and I guess, you know, the obvious question here is a, it's a dicey question in America when it comes to refugees and, and how long that, that uh, can last before it becomes a political challenge and political problem. Do you have any sense that there's any cost that the Duda government will pay for its generosity today? Uh, well, politically, it's, all, it's, um, it's complicated, of course. Uh, but I think when you, when you look, again, if you look at the polls in Poland and all those surveys which uh, uh, somehow uh, study and examine the Polish society's attitude towards mm -hmm. Ukrainians, it's also uh, pretty encouraging. Because before the war, there was fertile ground in Poland for the absorption of uh, hundreds of thousands and even millions of Ukrainians. Uh, because we had approximately 1.5 million Ukrainians living and working in Poland. Uh, very few racial incidents, like cases of uh, verbal or physical assaults on Ukrainians only because he or she spoke Ukrainian on the street. It, 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 it happened really rarely hmm. in Poland. So that, uh, that, that solidarity and uh, that sense that uh, they are our Slavic brothers and we share a common enemy as well. This is also important in that perception and, well, philosophically speaking, if Russia attacks one of our neighbors, no matter the, the, the religious differences, no matter the ethnic differences, no matter the linguistical differences, mm. although our languages are so similar to each other, that the Ukrainians, for example, learn Polish in a matter of months, which is also a very important factor in, uh, uh, when we talk about the integration of those Ukrainian refugees into the Polish society and into the Polish labor camp. So when Russia attacks one of our neighbors, it's almost a moral obligation for us and a historical obligation to defend that neighbor and also defend indirectly our own freedom. You know, we just recently interviewed Simon Schuster. Simon wrote the Time magazine cover story, spending a couple of weeks with the leadership uh, inside Kiev and particularly with President Zelensky. It was a very riveting account of what happened. And, and he shared with us that Zelensky does have a concern about the continuity of interest and continuity of commitment, particularly of the United States, but other allies there. Uh, Senators Mitch McConnell and John Barrasso and Susan Collins went over, but we've seen a vote on Ukrainian aid get 57 no votes in the U.S. Congress, which was very surprising to me. You know, you interact with this town a lot, in this Congress. Are you worried about America's attention deficit disorder coming uh, up and uh, becoming a problem in this? Uh, first and foremost, I am not authorized to comment on American po domestic politics. Mm. So not, I'm not going to go into detail of, of those deliberations about a stalled vote in the Senate. Uh, however, uh, as you rightly noted, I was a journalist for over 20 years, so I know more or less the mechanics. Mm. And I, I realize, I'm acutely aware that uh, in two months, in three months' time, the interest of the American public opinion but that principle applies also to Europe and to other countries, will fade away. Uh, no matter if that war ends shortly or we will, uh, you know, uh, witness a protracted confrontation. We have Roe v. Wade. Uh, we have inflation. We have the ongoing border crisis in America. So all those, uh, uh, they, they, those topics are uh, slowly but steadily pushing off the Ukrainian headlines, if you will, uh, from the American media. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, I also realize that this is a window, to put it uh, brutally, this is a window of opportunity for Poland to lay out its vision and to, to, uh, to show how important Poland is and how pivotal Poland has become over the last couple of weeks for Europe's security uh, and also for the United States um, uh, security and for the United States interests in this part of the world. You know, another dimension I'd just love to get your geostrategic hat on. Um, a lot of people almost in the U.S. Pre press have in a way de facto come to the conclusion that there's no way that Ukraine can become a member of NATO given what Bill Burns once called, Bill Burns, now director of CIA, but, but once ambassador to Moscow, said was a neuralgic issue for the Russians. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering if that's smart, that when you look at what NATO has done as an alliance for Polish security, but the Baltics and other neuralgic issues for Russians, um, 
whether we should be accepting that notion that Ukraine not become a member of there was NATO. A meme. What, is, what is your official view? There what is your private uh, There was a, a meme circulating on social media a few weeks ago about uh, NATO joining Ukraine and not the <laughs> other way around. Uh, I, it's up to the Ukrainians, of course. They have to decide. Uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the aspirations are pretty clear. Uh, their, uh, I mean, the approval rating of NATO as an international orga organization uh, has skyrocketed in Ukraine. Uh, it's up to them to decide whether they want to join this organization. Mm. Certainly not up to the Russians. Certainly not up to Mr. Putin to decide what direction Ukraine will be heading uh, in the future. But I will tell you what the game changer could be mm. for Ukraine and for Europe and also probably for the United States. Ukraine in joining the European Union. Mm. I, I just wanted to remind you of uh, 2014. Yanukovych was president. He was ousted from office. The Maidan revolution. It was not because Ukraine wanted to join NATO. It was not because America was building right. was building bio labs. Right. It was in because Ukraine. of the EU. It was because of the accession agreement Ukraine was about to sign with uh, the European Union. This is what Putin fears. As I said, Putin fears um, uh, a prosperous country at Russia's border, and he fears a country which effectively uh, cracks down on corruption, for example, because this is the core one of the core issues. Uh, in terms of Russia's relations with the neighboring countries, and especially those which had belonged to the Soviet Union before the collapse of uh, communism. Corruption is the most fertile ground for Russia to meddle into the internal affairs of Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, Belarus, and many other countries. Polish political leaders have been unambiguous that the only thing Putin recognizes and respects is force and power. Um, I'm just wondering how, if there's a consensus about that inside Europe. French President Emmanuel Macron had said, we're not at war with Russia. We need to work towards a ceasefire. A ceasefire should be our priority. And it always gets us back into that trap of looking at Again, what, is, not, what is efficacious and what is appeasement. And, and, and just what are your insights about how Europe is looking at Ukraine beyond Polish borders? I, I don't think that's a, a, a domestic question, but it's really about the state of, yeah. you know, European consensus about what to and do with again, this Again, I'm not entitled to comment on French domestic politics, <laughs> and I will have to be very diplomatic on, on this one. So it will take a while be, uh, uh, before I find uh, the correct uh, words. Uh, th there are some clear discrepancies within the European Union. Uh, it's no secret that France and Germany have a different opinion on uh, how we should proceed, especially in terms of, of uh, sanctions and mm. imposing even more severe uh, punishment right. on, uh, on Russia in the longer term. But I think where, where, when you mentioned uh, uh, the, the force, uh, something that uh, Russia really respects, or Putin himself, it's, on the, it's not only about force, it's not only about deterrence, it's also about stamina and determination, mm. for example, to uphold the economic sanctions uh, for many years to come. If we are not ready and willing to keep the pressure on Russia for the next 5, 10, 10 or even 15 years, we will not see Russia, the Russian economy being effectively crippled. And I believe this is our aim. Mm. It should be, at least. Um, the Russian society has yet to feel the pinch. The sanctions have yet to kick in. So it will take a while before we will see the real effects of, uh, of this common uh, front of the European Union, of the United States, and of some other countries which right. have joined our uh, camp in this particular situation. We have to be patient, but also right. determined, and also pretty persuasive in making our point in our talks with our French, German, Austrian, or Italian partners. You know, speaking of feeling the pinch, when I look at Poland's energy profile, you know, huge, uh, you're a huge energy importer. So oil, gas, oil, you know, oil, gas. They come from uh, Russia. Uh, come, comes from Russia, right, and coal. And when you kind of look at that and the Polish moves already yeah. to suspend gas imports, to suspend coal imports, and to commit by the end of this year to end uh, oil imports, how is that going to be backstopped? And when you look at your alliance structure, when you look at the United States, but it's not just us, it's you know, Qatar, it's other places in the world, how does the math add up that you're going to keep energy flowing in places because 
that, you know, that infrastructure was not there before, and are you concerned for your own citizens about how big that pinch will be? Uh, some European countries were addicted to Russian gas and oil, mostly gas, mm. for decades. Uh, many years ago, Poland came to the conclusion that we should render our country uh, entirely independent of mm. imports of Russian gas. And this is what we are doing right now. Uh, by October, we are, the, our long-term contract with Gazprom expires. We are not going to renew it. Mm. And uh, a new pipeline, the so-called Baltic pipeline, will be operational. Uh, we will deliver gas from the Norwegian continental shelf via Denmark to the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast. Uh, uh, six or seven years ago, uh, no, it was five years ago, we inaugurated uh, an LNG terminal also on the Baltic coast. We are importing now gas uh, from uh, the United States, mm. from uh, Qatar, and we also have some, uh, our own resources of this particular uh, raw material. Uh, it is a very encouraging and very reassuring development because we have always focused on energy security as one of the most important pillars of our collective security. So it is happening now. It is happening now. And we are so glad that there is an ongoing discussion also in Germany about that, that possible shift in Germany's energy policy. Mm. If they have started, even started talking about a return to nuclear, this is uh, uh, something really impressive and, and remarkable. I don't know whether they will finally choose to uh, this path, which would be a revolution in, in Germany's uh, internal politics. Uh, but I hope that uh, we will find common ground also with countries which uh, are now hesitant to cut off all those uh, economic ties with Russia. Let me ask one last question. I was recently in Estonia and was somewhat pleasantly surprised, but also uh, uh, kind of shocked to see that they have already moved to begin bringing young people into the woods to train them for the kinds of combat that we're witnessing in Ukraine. Uh, you know, generals are talking to these mostly young men, but also women, about hardcore person-to-person -person defense and their role in that. Is that happening in Poland? It has been happening in Poland for uh, quite a few years. We created the so-called territorial defense um, a few years ago, uh, which was at the time criticized by some circles mm. as a waste of money and time and energy. Mm. Now it turns out, and we can see Ukraine's experience, and we can see how important this kind of uh, warfare is and how important it is to prepare younger generations mm. uh, for an, uh, the eventuality of a confrontation with uh, with uh, our neighbor. Uh, again, I do hope that we will never have to fight for our freedom, as the Ukrainians are doing right now, but uh, we always have to be prepared. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Ambassador Marek Magyarovsky, Ambassador of Poland to the United States, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? In some ways, the Polish right now are more patriotic about freedom than many Americans are. They've seen firsthand and up front what a power vacuum near Russia can create. They also see their neighbor fighting for its life and very existence. And while Ukraine remains defiant, let's face it, there's never any certainty in the outcome of war. The reverberations of Russia's and Putin's decision to invade are going to be with us for decades and have already begun to change the international system. Poland is on the front line. America is a bit farther away, despite being heavily involved. But tying together their fates and creating a unified wall against further Russian aggression is going to be vital. And that's the bottom line.